<laughs> well, no, no, wait, I mean, so for all of you who went to the you know, Computer History Museum yesterday, you already know the, the history of this, you don't? <laughs> for those of you who didn't attend the museum yesterday, I will give you a background of <laughs> AIX and R6000. So, um, ready to proceed, everybody? So, uh, my name is David Edelson. I work at IBM Research in Yorktown, TJ Watson Research Center, and a lot with the uh, IBM Linux Technology Center. And this talk was originally uh, about AIX and the GNU toolchain port to AIX. I have expanded it a bit um, because of some other interests that people might want to know more about um, PowerPC, the power architecture in, in general, and uh, trying to provide a little bit of, of background about, um, because I know a lot of people have worked on, on recent ports, I mean, you know, porting a new architecture, and uh, the power architecture is one of the uh, PowerPC port, R6000 port, is one of the older architectures in GCC, and maybe some information about how it's adapted and uh, been ported and utilizes the uh, GCC and the GNU toolchain. So, I will begin. So first of all, no, it's not x86 and it's not Linux. Now, I know for some of you, you're gonna panic now. Okay, it, it, it's okay, it's okay. Even though it, it's, it's okay, you know, don't panic. So, you know, power is another architecture like ARM, Spark, MIPS. It's a risk architecture, but, you know, it, it's another one out there. Maybe you've heard of some of these other ones, but, you know, it's okay. You can breathe now. You can calm down. It'll, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. But then, okay, so now you're saying, okay, uh, I, I, I accept power. It, it's not x86, but I can deal with another processor. But what's this thing AIX? I mean, I've never heard of this. What, what is this thing? And, I mean, it's the city in Provence, right? And it's like... No, no, it's not X in Provence. It's not even AIX in Provence. It's, it's, you know, it's not that AIX. Oh, oh, but, but it's okay. It's okay. Don't panic. It's still going to be okay. So AIX is just, it's another operating system that's sort of Linux-like. It's, it's, you know, Unix is closer to Linux than it is to Windows. So it's this POSIX-like operating system. So, okay. So, so, you know, that's where we're starting from. So it'll, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. You don't think that was deliberate that AIX came to play on? I don't believe so. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it's, uh, AIX is an acronym for the Advanced Interactive Executive. That, that, that's, uh, that's <laughs> But maybe we can go back and, and, and tell the city in Provence that they should change their name to Advanced Interactive Executive because that fits so well with the French political model. So. <laughs> Um, Don't encourage it, otherwise I'm going to be XIA or something. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so the origins of AIX are, uh, it was you know, completely written inside IBM, but it's uh, the, the sort of pedigree from a, a compatibility standpoint was AT&T, Unix, and System 3 actually, not, not, not System 5, and incorporates a lot of techniques and, and design from the Open Software Foundation, which is a very antiquated, a, a long time ago consortium that some of you may remember, and it's a com POSIX compliant operating system. So now, um, I'm sure you're all thinking, oh, that's, you know, nice nostalgia, isn't that quaint? And it is. Um, but really, the outline of this presentation, I'm going to go through a little bit of background about PowerPC architecture, Power Linux on in, in the GNU tool chain and the ABI for that in general, and about AIX and the file format, and just what are the similarities and differences? How does AIX work in mainly GCC, but the GNU tool chain to some extent? And what's the remaining infrastructure that's available, and how one can port general applications to both Power Linux and to AIX in general? So. As I said, this, this talk is going to be, uh, you know, I'm not trying to give a, an in-depth detail of this is how the, the PowerPC architecture works, or this is how the latest Power 7 or the forthcoming Power 8 architecture internals, or details of GCC, but trying to give people some background that this isn't such a different type, uh, uh, architecture or different um, you know, operating system, ABI environment than, than, than people may uh, expect if they're just coming from the x86 Linux uh, experience and don't know what, what to expect. So the port was originally 
developed in the early 1990s by Richard Kenner, who was at the Courant Institute, and he works with uh, Ada, is now part of, works for Ada Corps. And the original architecture was called Power. Uh, it it's, was a slightly earlier variant of the, what's now the Power PC architecture, um, with slightly more complicated uh, CISC-like in, instructions in it. I mean, not, I mean, not so CISC-like, but more powerful instructions that um, uh, had some late, I mean, they were, actually, were slightly complicated for the microarchitecture when I was, I was get to the Power PC architecture was created as, as a uh, collaboration between IBM, Apple, and, and Motorola. Uh, the original processors were called RIOS. This was in the systems called RS6000, which stood for RISC System 6000. You may have be aware of like at System 360, if you again went to the computer museum, or AS400, RISC System 6000. It's just the naming scheme that IBM had. And the architecture and the operating system was called AIX, as, as we mentioned. The ABI itself was called AIX. Uh, it's now uh, been sort of renamed Power Open or a variant of Power Open. And the file format is a, a variant of COF at the time called XCOF. And again, this was all started in the um, early 1990s, and I believe Richard Kenner was um, hired in 1991, 92 to do the original port. And I came to IBM working on some other projects and needed to uh, have GCC working well for my actual graduate dissertation work and ended up fixing problems, fixing bugs in GCC on power and eventually Richard Kenner said, well you're doing all the work on this, why don't you take over the port? And that's how I got into the GCC community. <laughs> so now uh, everybody gets it in? Apparently. <laughs> so, so, so how do we, uh, so that's, that's a quiz for the end, so, so how do we find more people, to, you know, encourage more people to come to the GCC community now? How, <laughs> with that model. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, the original power architecture, um, then with a collaboration with IBM, Motorola, and Apple, uh, announced the power PC architecture, which was designed, I mean, the original, um, I guess, one of the marketing phrases was palm tops to petaflops, and designing an architecture, simplifying it in a certain way so that it, instead of being the, I think it was like six or eight actual, um, uh, separate chips was the original RISC um, RIOS architecture, RIOS processor with different function units on different chips to be able to combine it down into a, a single very high performance processing, single processing unit that all of these uh, collaborators could, could be able to build and use in their systems. And they, so they took out some of the more um, esoteric instructions uh, and creating the PowerPC architecture. And at the time I then worked on um, creating, moving the, uh, adding in the PowerPC instructions to the original power architecture port. And so this then evolved with uh, IBM hiring Cygnus, which some of you may have heard of, uh, <laughs> to, to work on the original port to, for supporting AIX and uh, PowerPC 32 ABI, uh, System 5R4 based ELF ABI and the Mac port by someone named Stan Shebs. I don't know where, where that person is anymore. Mention, mention why IBM cared about ELF. Say it. Say it. OS2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, but 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 the the ABI was actually created with SunSoft. I mean, it was it, it was strange, but the the targeted OS was was OS2. Oh, yes. So we had an actual PowerPC OS2 box. I didn't remember that. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think it was a prototype. It had evidence of being worked on by hand. Tools. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. It could be uh, PE cough. <laughs> so then we'll jump ahead to the, the, the work on Linux. And there actually was a project, sort of Skunk Works, inside IBM working on Linux 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It was actually using the XCOF file format. It was very early in Linux when they're on the, actually on the original Rios processors with the MCI bus and, and you know, weird I.O. Um, and eventually this work transitioned to 
to ELF as, especially in the external community, as, as Linux itself, GNU Linux sort of formalized and how they wanted to expand to multiple architectures. Uh, and using this PPC32 ABI. And there's also has been work on NetBSD using this, the same tool chain. Um, and just as a mention, not that I'm going to focus on that in, in, in the talk, but just that there are um, Motorola evolved into Freescale, and there are some other processors, um, variants of PowerPC from Freescale with uh, other capabilities, I mean, such as the, their SPE vector unit, um, uh, Bookie, uh, a thumb-like uh, extension to the PowerPC architecture called VLE, uh, an ABI supplement called the PowerPC EABI. So there's just a lot of variation, and if anybody has looked at the R6000 port and is curious why it is um, so unique and so you know, extensive, it's because there is not only has a lot of history, but it's supporting a very wide range of processors and wide range of different ABIs, operating systems. Um, and then we'll sort of jump ahead now to uh, PowerPC 64. And around the same time that, that PowerPC 64 came out in the late 1990s, it was about the time that IBM started, decided that Linux itself was very important uh, to the company and decided to um, have an official uh, uh, support Linux on all of its various architectures, on the mainframe Z systems and on power and x86 and support that across the board and at that time the Linux Technology Center was created. So jumping ahead to now, th this has full support for power on a very wide range of Linux distros. I mean the Red Hat Enterprise Linux and uh, SUSE Linux and various Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu at various times, NetBSD, even FreeBSD, a full complement of the GNU tools, the various packages, I mean, the Gold Linker, and uh, now things like LuidJIT are working on it. There's work on KVM, on the VHJIT. So there's a very large number of uh, all these the standard packages that one would expect on x86 Linux uh, and another Linux. Uh, uh, implementations available on power. And so now let's look a little bit at what it takes to actually r build a package or be able to compile for power and on uh, Linux and power x86. So one is that the current processors are again very powerful um, uh, processors with you know four threads per core. I mean I won't go into all, all the details, the technical details, but you know a few three to four gigahertz approximately in performance, up to 16 terabytes of physical memory are in the largest um, what are called um, power system uh, physical physically you know, built systems. Um, now has capabilities of vectorization. There was the original VMX. Uh, that was done in PowerPC with Apple and, and Motorola now extended to VSX. There's in the next generation Power8 processors there's going to be hardware transaction memory and also even uh, cryptography assist chip. Um, so you know a, a lot of capabilities and interesting capabilities in the process. <coughs> now the one first thing to understand about the power architecture is it's being used is that it's a big Indian architecture and so pointers point to the most significant bit, most significant byte. And one of the things I noticed recently in helping the CPython community uh, get their build boss up and ensure that CPython works on Power AI Linux and Power AIX is that they actually had a bug where they were passing a, uh, a <coughs> sort of their, their varargs, their internal structure as a pointer to a long and then reading it as a pointer to an integer. And on the Lendian systems, this will just sort of work ac you know, accidentally because you're pointing at the least significant bit. By design, not accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as a string. So it, it, it works by design so that you could, if, if they were looking at an integer, and they were passing small integers. It didn't require a full 64-bit bit. So therefore, it was able to work in the design with this mismatch in the, the types. That sort of problem. That, that power is actually good at pointing out, is able to, to find these, these errors in, with better coverage or with an, an alternate form of coverage of big Indian to find type mismatches. But that's just something that one needs to be aware of in writing software that needs to be more careful with these types of issues that it will sort of fall through the cracks in, in a little Indian system and will actually uh, come back to bite you. In this case, you know, um, the 
Python was either you know getting zeros in the upper byte or just or getting you know some random garbage instead of seeing the actual <laughs> small value, which fixing the the types fixed that problem. So at one time, IBM was dab dabbling in little endian power PC. Is that pretty much fallen by the wayside? I mean, it's not so much the, the power PC architecture has always been defined to work on both little endian and big endian. The chips, I think most of the chips supported it, and Power 7 and, and Power 8 fully support operating in that mode. Um, and there were, there were some restrictions, I mean, some of it used to be microcoded, it's now full performance, and there's some, um, I, I think it's even full performance for misaligned accesses as well. Um, so that means you could build a little engine power PC nowadays if you wanted to? Yes. I, I've been noticing there has been patches for Power PC 64 Yep. I mean, it's just important to have, you know, these bug fixes in, in the system. We're just trying to, to clean out these issues. But yeah, it's perfectly possible to run a little Indian system as, as well as a big Indian system. And people have continued to experiment with that. So, it's, it's, so, so the, the, the official story is that it's not excluded. No. Or, or it's supported, but if you want to do much with it, or actual systems aren't built with it. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it, the original. I think the original power architecture was only big endian. It was only power PC that defined a little endian mode, and there have been some ports, embedded ports, that wanted little endian and have run that way. Um, and it, I mean, but it's possible to build a, a system and run, you know, power Linux and little endian you know, with the right tools and the right pieces. Um, let's see. It's. I mean, it's it's it's, I mean, it's just. Um, so be, I mean, be, be, because because IBM systems were all designed as, or I mean, AIX was big ending, and the rest of the sort of mentality. I mean, the mainframes are big ending, and everything else has been big ending. IBM's approach to all of this has been big ending, and there were you know at at the time there were some. Um, Argue, I mean, there, you know, I, I won't go into the Indianist war. I mean, you can look up the history of why at, at some point people thought the big Indian were better, a little Indian to get you know, the most significant byte first, and some things for caches and memory controllers, there were some advantages. But just because IBM has the, the background of big Indian, it simply chose to build, I mean, the similar big Indian system. I don't know if it was part of the, I don't know if it affected the I.O. design and the, uh, the infrastructure as, as well with the original MCI systems. Um, but it just sort of naturally take, took that same approach with Linux. So in theory, so what you, <clears throat> I understand what you're saying is, if you wanted to build, you, you could essentially buy the chips from IBM and build a little Indian system that would just work. It should just work, yes. Um, well, I mean, I, mean, I mean, with the appropriate... Um, well, not just tool team, but I mean, appropriate peripherals and, you know, if you can get the whole... I mean, it's, what, what I'm saying is that, um, I mean, yes, the power processor itself will be little Indian, but I'm saying that if you just take a, um, a P-series system or, I mean, from IBM and say, okay, I just want to boot a little Indian kernel on that, that that isn't necessarily um, a, a trivial task. I mean, that, that there's... You have to build your hardware. Oh, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you build a system around it, that work. But, but I mean... It would just work. If you yes. Oh yeah, it definitely, definitely does just work. Um, and so another characteristic, I mean, different from Intel x86 or AMD x86, the i32 x86-64 architecture is uh, a weak memory ordering to just be aware of, that loads and stores can be reordered. Uh, it's, it's a classic sort of load store architecture. There aren't in-memory operations. You can't do just sort of an atomic um, even within the processor atomic operation by a single instruction. Uh, so, and there are uh, instructions in the ISA, in the instruction set architecture, uh, to emit the synchronization instructions. And in GCC, there are built ins that have been enabled the mem thread fence built in or the direct built in LW sync for lightweight sync, which will emit the appropriate instruction to ensure uh, SMP synchronization and, and uh, ensure that you have the, the correct um, dependencies between memory operations. And similarly, the instruction cache is also split from the data cache, and if one is um, 
just loading any instructions or performing any sort of self-modifying code, one needs to emit an appropriate instruction to ensure that that is reflected in the instruction cache of synchronizing that and, and uh, some other sequence that I didn't present here because I won't, don't want to go into details and in too much depth, but to ensure that the uh, instruction cache is flush and it didn't try to prefetch some instructions before that synchron the data cache and instruction cache synchronization occurred. And similarly, as I mentioned, there is the atomic operations, which require a sort of like the classic similar to alpha load length and store conditional instructions. And so this is not the lock prefix that one can add to uh, x86 to get a, an atomic SMP operation. And but again, the GCC atomic built-ins, the original sync built-ins, and now the atomic built-ins all work. And I give an example at the bottom of the sort of code that is produced for an atomic add operation where you're going to load the value from uh, some pointer uh, into a register with this load linked instruction which sets a reservation on that memory to ensure that nobody else changes it before this store. You perform the, the normal uh, arithmetic or logical operation on that instruction and then you store it back with this special store conditional instruction to ensure that the no other uh, uh, effect occurred for that memory in between, uh, I mean, at this, when that uh, logical or arithmetic operation occurred. And if it fails, then it stores a condition register and one loops around in the code until that, uh, uh, that, that reservation c properly clears. So again, as I, as I mentioned before, the, the PowerPC32 ABI, which I'm not going to focus on, was originally created by Sunsoft and IBM. And again, here's an example of a call instruction or the equivalent of a call on x86 versus power where a call, I mean, would just be a, you know, the, the call instruction on x86. Here it actually requires two steps of loading the pointer, the function address, the uh, code address into a register and then from that register moving it into what's called the, the count register on PowerPC and then branching the count. But it's a, a fairly simple, uh, I mean, internally x86 is performing essentially the same operations, it's just as a risk architecture this is explicitly exposed in the ISA. And similarly for PowerPC 32 ABI in um, loading a value from memory, uh, it doesn't have a full 32-bit uh, immediate field for all load and store operations is actually the uh, opcodes only allow 16-bit uh, immediate so the address in a 32-bit ABI needs to be split between the upper half and the lower half and this uh, in sequence in the upper right shows the the two steps that are needed to load a value at an arbitrary address for some variable g and here you're loading the high part of g into register 9 and then doing the load with the low part of the address relative to register 9 loading into register 3. And on the, the left bottom left side you can see how a position independent code would work for the 32-bit ABI. The first one needs to obtain addressability by branching to the next instruction. This uh, provides the, the current address of the instruction stream in the, the link register. Then one needs to do a little bit of, of dancing around in that, that first code above L2 to actually find the base of the GOT register. And the GOT should be familiar to people who use x86 uh, or any other you know, Linux ELF ABI. Um, to, in this case, it's getting the, finding the address of the, the GOT table relative to that address uh, uh, that was discovered in, in L2 to find out what the base of the, the GOT table is. And then the actual load itself, again, is just this, this one instruction there of loading uh, the value of the variable G through the GOT at you know, red offset of register 30. So you can find from uh, what the actual address is and load the value up. And then cleaning up after the, uh, the, the GOT uh, addressability. Now the 64-bit ABI is a little bit more complicated. It's based on the AIX ABI, uh, which was written with the assistance of Ian Taylor and Torbjörn Granlund. And um, I don't know, Diego, do you know where Ian is now? I've, I haven't seen him in a long time. 
<laughs> oh, that okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> and it has two interesting characteristics. Uh, one is function descriptors, again, inherited from the AIX ABI, and the other is the, the talk or the, the table of contents, which is very much like the, the GOT, except the talk as defined by ABI is a compiler managed um, table of offsets as opposed to a linker managed table of offsets. I mean, there, there are certain other minor differences, but that's sort of at the very highest level, the, the difference that's involved. So just to give you a little bit of background, this is what a function descriptor on AIX or PowerPC Linux looks like. You'd have a function pointer which points to this three-word array or three-field item which contains the actual code address of the function you want to call, and another data item which is the addressability pointer. So instead of having to f discover the got base address in the function itself is passed in as part of the function descriptor. It's set in the, essentially the procedure linkage table and the, the equivalent of the plit from this um, official program descriptor. And then there's an environment pointer which is, is not only used for languages like Pascal and others that basically allows, um, I mean, oh, 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 it, it's, uh, it can be helpful for, for those languages to get a, a static chain. Um, but the one advantage of the function descriptors is, is for safety that one can create uh, trampolines that are pure data. And you are, don't need any sort of um, executable stack for trampolines. You aren't creating any sort of other um, uh, code dynamically and you can't just sort of arbitrarily write to uh, ha have some of the overflow and security concerns that one would have with a, a, the x86 ABI. <coughs> So here's what an indirect call looks like. And I know, again, this is a little bit, you know, a lot more instructions, a lot more code, but I'll explain a little bit about what's going on. So in this instruction, again, register three would contain a pointer to the function. And as, again, this needs to load up the, uh, the function descriptor, as I mentioned. So the first instruction, as I said, the first field is the code address. So that first instruction is loading the code address from the actual talk, I mean, sorry, from the function descriptor. Um, then one needs to save the, the current addressability pointer, which uh, AIX and PowerPC Linux, 64 bit Linux, use the re register two for that, so it needs to preserve that register in a well known location on the, in the each stack frame. It loads up this environment pointer, it moves the instruction, I mean, the, the first instruction and the fourth one are eff effectively what we were doing for the PPC32 API, where you had the address directly. So it'll move the target address into the count register, it loads up the, the, the new talk address, and then it bran branches to that, through that counter register to the actual address, and after the return from the call, it needs to restore the addressability for the current function. So there's a lot of instructions that are somewhat done implicitly in x86, but it's basically a, the necessary steps to be able to follow and deal with the function descriptor. As I mentioned, it's, the talk is very much like the system 504 got. Um, it's the address of global variables. It's managed by the compiler instead of the linker. Um, and in the PowerPC Linux ABI, 64-bit ABI, it's actually a merger of the got and the talk. So one can use the tr traditional got addressing as well, or one can use the talk addressing. And so here's an example of how one would access a global variable with the talk. In the, the left side, um, one sees a, that the talk entry is actually set up of a talk for this variable G uh, at, with label LC0, and then at the actual location that one is going to load the variable, one gets, again, the upper half of the uh, I mean, the address and the, the lower half of the address out of the talk, <coughs> and then is able to set up, load the actual variable itself. And you can compare that to the type of instruction that's necessary for x86. That is not, uh, again, it has um, a God address that it gets relative to its RIP, its uh, instruction pointer relative addressing, and still needs to do this full 64-bit move out of that God address. It's simply a matter of the way that this address is obtained in a RISC-like architecture versus a CISC-like architecture. Um, the talk size in 32-bit on AIX, 32-bit doesn't use the PPC32 Linux ABI. It actually uses the same AIX ABI, and so it has 
uh, 16,000 entries in the talk. 64-bit uh, ABI allows uh, six, uh, six, 8,000 entries in the talk, which can overflow, and so there was some work done in various ways to allow uh, overflow of this talk area. One is uh, some initial work that's similar to what the Excel compiler do, uh, implements, which is to have a separate pool for static variables and a separate pool for constant variables, and have a pointer to those pools in the talk. So that was able to move some uh, variables, uh, semi-global variables, into uh, separate, uh, sorry, separate areas uh, that to not uh, overflow the talk. And then there's also some, that's essentially what is called now the, s the small code model in GCC for PowerPC. <clears throat> there's a medium model which uh, allows direct 32-bit offsets, so instead of having one instruction to get to the talk, it allows two instructions that are able to access not just the talk and the GOT, but if the data is within uh, a appropriate range, within the 32-bit range, you can directly access the, uh, the data section as well. And then the large talk model, which allows extremely large talks, as long as the talk itself is addressable within 32 bits. And the way this is implemented in GCC from very early days of Richard Kenner was by considering the talk itself to be the constant pool that, that GCC generally supports. So for any variable that one is creating, one calls into force constant mem to be able to push that variable into the constant pool, which becomes the actual talk as it's emitted, and then gets back the, the talk uh, label itself, and then it uses uh, appropriate references for talk labels as if we're addressing the constant pool and the talk and again the variables are emitted in the constant pool itself. So then here's just a, a, a sort of an overview of the the stack layout for um, both the 32-bit AIX and 64-bit uh, PowerPC Linux and AIX which shows some of the issues of the stack which is slightly more complicated than the x86 stack. I mean one of the main things is that it has the back chain to the caller, so it, it's human readable and you can walk back the stack fairly easily in the first, where the, the stack pointer itself points. Um, and then there's some of the other uh, uh, reserved words for the compiler and the linker, and you'll see down in the, the sixth entry, the, the save talk pointer, that was at offset of 40 again, if you look at the 64-bit column, in that code that I showed the example of an indirect call, that's the uh, fixed location in each stack where the, the call, uh, the, the current or the function's talk pointer is preserved to be able to be restored upon reentry and the new talk pointer is obtained from the function descriptor. But one thing that this does is that it makes uh, what one might want is a, a equivalent of a push or a pop in the x86 architecture a little bit more difficult in that if one is allocating memory uh, dynamically with, for instance, alloca or alloc A, one would need to, most of these entries in the stack wouldn't have been preserved because there's no function call yet except the back chain itself, but one needs to, when one's expanding the stack, one moves this back chain pointer down to a new area, preserves that fixed area of um, you know, 48 bytes, and then the alloc A area expands sort of in the middle of that stack frame, not at the very bottom. Um, so as I mentioned, you, it, you, you get this expansion, it opens in the mid, sort of not in the middle of the entire stack, but in that stack frame, which is a little bit confusing to people who want just a simple way of, uh, you know, allocating memory. Uh, a couple of AIX differences, there's, there's the alignment and padding, there's linker shared libraries, archives in the XCOF file format. Just to explain a little bit, one thing is the AIX ABI now transitioning a little bit from Linux allows uh, double precision variables are word aligned, not double aligned. So not everything is, has natural alignment. Uh, long, long integers, however, are double word aligned. This is just because um, these larger types weren't uh, available in C and other languages at the time that the ABI was being defined and they really unfortunately didn't prepare ahead for and said, well, you know, well, it's just one type that that's, has this, this larger alignment, we won't impose that restriction. Um, another thing that's different between just the PowerPC Linux ABI and the AIX ABI is how structs are padded. 
that structs in uh, AIX are, are padded so that uh, variables are placed at the, the high order bits. In Linux, they're placed for PowerPC Linux at the low order. So if I just uh, want to treat a struct as, that contains a single variable as that data type itself, in AIX, I actually need to shift it down into the appropriate position if it's not a, a, a word size or a, a, a register sized variable a type in that struct. In Linux, I can just uh, immediately address that structure as the variable itself. So that's one difference. Um, the linker is, is unique and in sort of ad advanced in various ways at the time that, that Linux is, and GNU load or gold has, has caught up a, a lot, but it's has always been garbage collecting and so it and uh, reorders what are called c sex or control sections, another uh, feature that was uh, inherited from the mainframe, which are the basic uh, addressability and relocatability piece in, uh, in, in sections in the AIX uh, uh, XCOF file format. And so one can think of these, these control sections if one use like function sections or data sections uh, options in GCC which work on AIX as well, then it'll place each function or each data item in its control section, but one needs to ensure in the final link that uh, everything is properly referenced, or again, like the garbage collection that can occur in the GNU in the GNU load or Gold Linker, you can remove you know what appear to be unreferenced variables or, or functions uh, that you know need to be explicitly exported, or somehow in, ensure that there's visibility that the linker knows there's going to be external visibility to it, and therefore it needs to be available for let's say passing a function pointer or some external access that's going to occur to it. Um, shared objects are, and, and shared libraries are a little bit unique on AIX as well. That, I mean, there's sort of a joke of people looking at AIX and saying, oh, I only see these .a files. Oh, AIX doesn't support, it's only static libraries. It's not a shared libraries. The way that the AIX traditionally worked for shared libraries was a shared library or shared object was an object file, but it actually allowed these shared objects to be archived. So instead of, you can create an archive of static object files of all my, you know, the dados from compilation. In AIX, you can create an archive of shared object files. These are just other .o files or can be .o. And this is how versioning works, the equivalent of the Linux, uh, uh, you know, libx.so. So in other words, if I had a library on AIX with multiple versions and, and multiple changes and I wanted to be able to link to the latest version of this, like having, you know, lib whatever, you know, dot so pointing to the latest version, but I needed to have the previous uh, versions of the library available for backward compatibility. In Linux, one would have multiple versions of the, the named library with the interfaces actually available in the you know, user lib or wherever this was installed with the appropriate architecture namespace. In AIX, one would actually only have one archive library, this libfoo.a, and that would contain all the different versions of the shared library in that archive. And so, or, I mean, that's how it works on AIX. I mean, GCC and building doesn't um, go to that level of complexity, or libtool doesn't understand this detail, but just if you look at AIX, this is how it works, so that one would have the most recent version of the library, which is linkable, and then the previous versions of those shared objects with a special bit set that those objects are only loadable by programs but not available for link. And so therefore, a, an application trying to actually link against you know, libfoo.a wouldn't see that the, the loader, the linker wouldn't see that as being available of exporting any symbols, but it would be available by the dynamic loader at runtime to if a a, a, an application were linked against an older version of that library and explicitly called out for that member. So it's again, think of this as you know, equivalent, just a, a different way of providing the same functionality as Linux with you know, library versioning. Um, this, there's some complications with, with visibility in exporting symbols, which um, is, is again sort of ahead of the time, if, if one wants to think about it that way, of what the, new, the visibility infrastructure that's been incorporated into Linux over the past couple of years, where Linux with System 5 initially allowed every 
global external symbol to be overridable. And now there's been work on hidden symbols to really differentiate between what's a global variable in the application and what's the external uh, API that one wants to be able to program to. AIX has had that essentially from the very beginning with its export files. It's now adding some visibility feature equivalent to the into XCOF equivalent to the ELF visibility. But it was essentially an external file that provided that same capability of which are the global variables that I want to export. Um, and, it, and there are some details with a couple of options for which we're going to be exported um, by default and some additional um, ability to, to automatically export more of these, uh, some more symbols, uh, uh, either the only ones that, that seem to be imported by another module, global references, except underscores, uh, or all global symbols, though all global symbols can provide or create some problems with um, you know, sort of clutter and, and, and too much you know, too much, too many symbols being exported. So LibTool actually has a special feature for building a shared libraries and understands this to explicitly find the appropriately named uh, symbols, including underscore Z for the, the C++ or the, the name mangling that's used in, in GCC, G++, to export all the appropriate global symbols that are necessary. Uh, again, it, it also, AIX provides the uh, runtime linking and overriding capabilities similar to System 5R4, though the default is more like B symbolic, where um, one can't override symbols, so it's similar to the B symbolic in the GNU linker. Um, the XCOF file format is again, um, you know, an another unique feature. Uh, originally, debugging was implemented with stab strings. Uh, that's now provide support for Dwarf, though that hasn't been implemented in GCC yet. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just a different uh, syntax for describing variables, for describing, I mean, not variable, but describing section names, or introducing a function. Is, is XCOF the default, or? Yes. Uh, well, is the only file format, but the, the stab strings <coughs> and, and XCOF, quote, quote, debugging is still the default. Um, and GCC doesn't yet have an implementation of the dwarf support, or and nor has been utils. There's some work, as I'll mention, going forward with uh, AdaCore working on adding some of that dwarf support, and hopefully that'll be, be coming soon. Um, but as far as the exception handling, that's the standard dwarf that uh, uh, Red Hat Engineering Services was contracted for a number of years ago and implemented by emitting the dwarf exception handling in the text section. Um, they were just, you know, you know, supporting the XCOF file format just required changing a lot of the standard macros, and it's all supportable in, in GCC without, I mean, there's some details, but without a lot of trouble, it was just section names, just handling the different syntax in all the various places. How you start a file, how do you declare a function, how you declare different ASM ops for, you know, a, a, an unaligned or aligned type of long. It's just, you know, it's not using the standard ELF names, but it's all equivalent out there. Um, similar for constructors and destructors, it doesn't have the ctor destor sections or the init finny sections, but there is a command line option to be able to specify uh, a various constructors and destructors in ordering. So it's basically the same functionality, the same concepts, just different syntax. Um, a little bit of other background about map, uh, dealing with larger applications or other applications. It has mmap, AIX's mmap is a little bit quirky, it doesn't support the no reserve flag, but it, AIX in general uh, doesn't allocate backing store for um, uh, malloc or, or mmap uh, space. Map fixed has some limitations which aren't the same as Linux, and I was actually dealing with that recently in the port to V8, where V8 was using mmap in a certain way to be able to, uh, uh, for its, its semi-spaces to be able to, to turn on and off uh, uh, accessibility to it and, uh, and that with map fix in ways that, Linux, that AIX didn't want and they just needed to use uh, a, a different standard uh, uh, bits or you know, control of the, uh, the, the pre-existing mapping that occurred to turn off the protection, M protect instead of M map. It's map. Uh, but it, I mean, it's POSIX, it's not Linux, uh, it doesn't have you know, proc or sys file systems, but it has pretty much the entire GNU toolchain. 
um, you know, stabs to bugging dwarf that I mentioned, you know, the uh, dwarf is, is in development, you know, Apache, Python, Ruby, all of these standard packages work. Um, interesting features of AIX is the memory size, memory bandwidth, storage keys, which actually are sort of similar to MMAP, changing the protections, but like a call gate, they can be changed very rapidly with one instruction and not actually going through the entire page table to change mappings. Um, next steps we're looking at are, you know, improving the inlining heuristics, um, better support for bin utils and dwarf, I mean, improvements in pthread and, and thread local storage. We have both a power Linux system at the compile farm and an AIX system that was just donated. Um, so in summary, uh, power, Linux and power AIX is just this big, complicated, different, scary, imposing. Um, okay, so uh, no, okay, so it's just you know power Linux and AIX. It's power PC. It's not AIX, but AIX is not Linux, but it's not alien, you know, and it's just a fun new challenge and interesting system to work on. So and I hope. All of you will, you know, maybe find some more interest in, in, in you know, chip in and, and port some packages and help improve it. Thanks very much.